everybody. <laughs> We are so excited to welcome you all here to Detroit. My name is Abigail Venman. I'm the Senior Director of Arts Leadership for Sphinx. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Before we commence with the opening plenary, I wanted to call your attention to a couple of items. First and foremost, we wish to thank the funders of Sphinx Connect, including the Ford Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, and Bank of America for their support of the Sphinx Orchestral Partners audition. <laughs> In addition, many of our Sphinx Connect speakers are current and or former members of the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra, which is sponsored by Mercedes-Benz Financial Services. As you may have learned from an email or observed on signage throughout the conference center, we will incorporate slido.com during the question and answer period of various Sphinx Connect sessions. That means in addition to having the opportunity to ask questions verbally at the appointed time, using your smart device, you may also type questions to the speakers and like the questions of your fellow audience members. To use this free technology during the session, just visit slido.com, enter hashtag Sphinx Connect, and select the conference room in which you are located, and it's that easy. Finally, please be sure to visit the registration and information table just outside the ballroom to register for the conference if you haven't already. You'll receive an envelope full of really important things like the conference program, your name badge, the drink tickets for the receptions later, um, and much, much more. <laughs> and if any major uh, changes arise in our conference schedule, like inclement weather, I'll be sure to email everybody to let you know of any updates, okay? And now, to launch Sphinx Connect 2018, please join me in welcoming two incredible musicians to our stage. Sphinx Competition Jury Member and Sphinx Board Member Rachel Barton Pine and Sphinx Competition Jury Member and former Sphinx Laureate Juan Miguel Hernandez.
so one day, a woman walks by the beach, as is her daily ritual, not too far away in her line of sight. She sees a shadow that almost looks like a child dancing. As she nears the image, she notices it's actually a young boy who kneels down to the ground, picks something up, releases it into the ocean. She gets a little closer to take a look. It actually is a boy who picks up starfish, actually hundreds of starfish, um, that have been washed ashore because of the storm, and he's releasing them into the ocean. So she gets even nearer, and she asks the child, what's he trying to accomplish? There are hundreds of starfish. How could saving just a few make any difference? And the boy leans down, picks up the starfish, releases it into the water, says, made a difference to that one. So I'm sure it's a very, very familiar story, but um, the point that I hope to come across um, today is that too often in our world, we're faced with decisions to act on a problem or on an issue. And each time we weigh our pros and cons, like leadership training says, we, despite our tendency to romanticize all the details from the past, it's always as simple as a decision to act on something or to sit something out. And there's always reasons, and reasons are plenty, and we can always justify our actions because there's not enough funding to bring something to scale, because the funding community would really like to see some significant metrics, and we can't do that with insignificant funding, or because our available resources only would permit us to dip our toes in the water. God forbid should we dip our toes in the water. We don't do that. And it's, it's just not the same as cre creating fundamental systemic change. After all, incremental change is not enough. And imagine the backlash from our constituents if we only do something on a small scale. We really have to have money for branding and then third party valuation and so on and so forth. I'm sure it all sounds really familiar. The other one of my favorites is it, it has to be replicable because God forbid we should do something just because it's the right thing to be doing at first. So I'm sure it sounds familiar, but so does the starfish tale, tale right? But today I'm here in front of you to ask you to hear me out for a little bit because I'm going to sing the ode to incrementalism. I know it doesn't sound inspiring, it's not aspirational, it's not glamorous, but you know, it's only a few minutes. So, here's a humor slide for us. So a grotesquely, a very grotesquely simplified explanation in what I'm hoping to come across lies in the activation energy theory which suggests that the initial amount of energy to start a reaction is significantly higher than the amount of energy required to keep it going. We're not about to have a science lesson because I'm not qualified for that. But it, it's to say that there's good news on the horizon, right? It means that doing good with what we have right now, the resources we have right now, is not only important, but it's also incumbent upon us. Things always start with someone taking a first step, and every first step almost by its definition has to be incremental, right? Because it's just the first step. It is human nature to paint it big in retrospect. Whenever we talk about something that ended up being successful, we say it was fundamental, it was historic, it was momentous. But really, it's at the time of its occurrence, it's just about doing it, making a decision to do it. And my point here is to say, relax. We actually, none of us are starting anything that wasn't here before us. We just have to carry it out, and we have to have that strong follow-through. In 1964, the year of passing of the Civil Rights Act, and the year before the march from Selma to Montgomery, Sanford Allen already was the first African-American to join a major symphony orchestra, New York Philharmonic. While the Symphony of the New World, the first racially integrated orchestra performed at Carnegie Hall that same year, and then only four years later, Tanya Leone, a Cuban-American composer and conductor, already became the founding music director of the Music Theater of Harlem, so lots of firsts. In 1999, the Marian Anderson String Quartet already became the first African-American string quartet to win a major international competition. And now, our own Eugene Rogers already started the first professional black and Latino professional vocal ensemble. So we are here today because our work in inclusion and diversity remains that needed, that urgent, and follow through hungry. There are not even 400 black and Latino musicians in American orchestras. And the fate of the next one literally depends on an incremental step or a decision you and I will take. 
So each step we delay because we're still working on that data gathering or institutional buy-in, each incremental decision has the potential for something transformative to be delayed or just never be done. I'm sure that's familiar also. And it is my hope that this room, that the people in this room will no longer uh, permit that to happen. And just before we turn our attention to our actual opening plenary, I want you to think about, for a second, about something beautiful and actually take a look at the screen. It's a butterfly, but also a tornado. So it's something I like to talk a little about. In the chaos theory, and we can always claim chaos in this field, we're always in a state of chaos. In the chaos theory, something that I find fascinating, there's a phenomenon called the butterfly effect. I'm sure many of you know about it. It comes from the metaphorical example of the details of a tornado. The exact time of a formation and the path that it takes is being influenced by minor perturbations such as the flapping of the wings of a distant butterfly. It literally happens distances and weeks earlier, but it then has this grandiose effect. So for our purposes and in layman's terms, the butterfly effect is simply a concept that reminds us that small causes can have very large effect. In the end, it is about every person in this very room taking many, many uncomfortable, incremental, but razor sharp, small steps. And sometimes it is against the grain and other times it's really even against your better judgment. Each step causing and informing the next, leading to that changed paradigm that we all hope to see. So in 1997, there was an individual who didn't have exactly the privilege to sit in a room like this one with hundreds of like-minded individuals. In fact, many times he found himself to be only one or maybe one of a few in any room that he went to. From where he sat, change in the size of a tornado was the only thing that was going to transform the way our field works. And yet, at the time, a college student, he knew that wasn't going to be possible. So he wanted to start someplace. So he began simply by inviting 12 young black and Latino string musicians to compete right here in Michigan to learn and commune together and showcase their talents. So it started incremental. Some might say not transformative enough, but here's another slide, right? And that's just from last year. I think it's fair to say the rest is history and after celebrating the talents of these young artists at the White House, at the Supreme Court of the United States, at Carnegie Hall and Kennedy Center, in 12 different countries worldwide, it's probably fair to say that the man has gotten a tornado. Having gone on to lead then the University of Michigan's School of Music, Theater and Dance and serve as President Obama's first appointment to the National Council on the Arts, he's now a professor of arts leadership and entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan where that all began with an incremental step. So my only request to everyone young and old in this room for our time together for this week, never underestimate the impact upon one starfish and the power of a single butterfly. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, please give a Detroit welcome to the founder of the Sphinx organization, tonight's keynote and my life partner, Aaron Dworkin. Another round for Appa, who's doing such an unbelievable job. The leadership that Appa has brought to Sphinx over the past several years has really been extraordinary, and I've just been in awe uh, of you as I have my whole life, but uh, especially related to the leadership of Sphinx the last few years has been extraordinary as evidenced by this incredible gathering. So I figured that it might be good to kind of uh, try to offer when they asked me to uh, kind of share a few words at the beginning of the conference to try and help provide some framing, to pose that in the form of a question, which is what if? And so I'm gonna repeat that several times as I share some of this information with you. And in specific, 
what if we all threw the dice, which I'm going to describe to you uh, as really being diversity, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. So these are kind of the four frameworks that I'm going to talk about uh, here this evening and framed in this kind of context of what if. So to start out, I wanted to just give, and many of you may have a general idea of my background, but I always want to share it just very briefly because it informs really everything that I have to share. And I think for almost all artists, who we are is what we have to express through our particular artistic medium. So I was born uh, on, of all days, 9-11. Um, but I was immediately given up for adoption. And I was adopted by a white Jewish couple who were neuroscientists who not only that, but they already had a biological son, my older brother, who now practices cellular biology and biogenetics uh, at Columbia in New York. Fast forward 31 years, I was reunited with my birth parents, my birth father, who's black Jehovah's Witness, my birth mother, who's white Irish Catholic, who not only got back together, but ended up having another child, my full sister, who they did raise and we've become incredibly close. She went to the University of Michigan, and now she's practicing law in New York City. So basically, in the end, when I think about myself and as an artist, I am basically a black, white, Jewish, Irish, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness who grew up with a big afro playing the violin. <laughs> so you wonder where this whole diversity thing kind of came from. Uh, so that's kind of this biological background. And then at the same time, I started playing the violin when I was five because of my adoptive mother, who was an amateur violinist. Started playing at the age of five, had wonderful opportunity to have great access to teaching. Vladimir Grafman is one of the great you know, teachers who taught Gingold and uh, others, who of course, who taught Joshua Bell and so on and so forth. So I had really access to great teaching. Originally grew up in New York, 92nd Street Y. 10 years old, moved to Hershey, Pennsylvania. Quite an interesting transition for me. Uh, would go on Saturdays down to Peabody Prep, study with Burl Sanofsky. Junior and senior year of high school were at the Interlochen Arts Academy. Started out at Penn State, uh, and then ended up taking four years off, but returned to the University of Michigan where I got my bachelor's and master's in violin performance. And I think, what if I wouldn't have been adopted? And not just that, but I think about the role that all these various individuals played in my life. What if they weren't there? And I think about the institutions that played a role in my life, without which I wouldn't have been able to develop my craft. I wouldn't have been able to become the person who I am. I wouldn't have been able to found Sphinx, founded it while I was a student at the University of Michigan. What if I never went to these institutions? And I raise that because many of you reflect and or will reflect and or represent and or have an influence on what institutions do. And we'll talk about that in a second. So I wanted to kind of share this overall framing of our field. Because as we think about issues, and as you think about the conversations you'll have over the next few days, I encourage you to think about the overall context within which we do our work, within which we celebrate the amazing artistry that's going to take place, and especially on Sunday. So a good example is what we see in American orchestras. No big surprise, blacks and Latinos are about 2% in our orchestras, and many people know these statistics, and you can find them online as well. League of American Orchestras and others uh, have really been doing a good job, better than uh, some of other disciplines in the performing arts, in really tracking and sharing and talking about some of this information. I'm going to talk about that, too, in just a second. So music directors, conductors, also no big surprise, about 2% black, Latino, uh, and um, executive directors. Less than half of 1% are black, less than 1% are Latino. When we look at artistic administrators across America's orchestras, less than 1% are black, less than 1% Latino. Even if we look at our education and community relations directors, so here is a core person, right, tied to leading connection to the community, to building that engagement in the surroundings of an orchestra. Unfortunately, it's still only 3% for blacks and 2% for Latino. Taking a quick look at repertoire, programming, no big surprise, 0% of the top 10 composers are black or Latino, but of course we are also performing very few North American composers. So I thought it would be important, let's actually pull out that subset. 
Even if we pull out the subset of only North American composers who are being performed, it's still 0%. So if the Sphinx organization had a goal after 21 years to have just 1% of the works performed by all of America's orchestras, just 1% be by any composer of color, we have yet to reach that milestone. This is the framework. So what if the numbers were different? Because numbers are never just numbers. Numbers are stories. So what if our stories were different? Let me give you a quick example. I often mention some of the wonderful things and that have occurred in history that oftentimes, unfortunately, many of us aren't aware of. This is a quick uh, kind of snapshot. You can't read all the writing, but you can absolutely look it up. It is online. But it's an article that Leonard Bernstein wrote in 1947 into the New York Times, talking about the Negro in music. This other is a letter from Agnes Ames, who was president of the New York Philharmonic, that he wrote to the National Urban League. This is a clip from the New York Times. You see Sanford Allen, who Alpha referenced. And the pull quote you read, the hardening line between whites and blacks in the arts is not being discussed openly by leaders of our cultural institutions. 1960s. 1969, Amias Ames, president of the New York Philharmonic, wrote, we notify the Urban League and Corps, which is the Congress of Racial Equality, of every audition, made other inquiries to learn of available and qualified black symphonic musicians, and provided over 160 scholarships to black instrumentalists. Leonard Bernstein himself wrote, there ought to be more and better qualified teaching in schools. There should be scholarships given them at such places as Juilliard, Curtis, Eastman, etc." 1947 two years after World War II. So I think about this history, and I think about the famed Chimamanda Adichie's writings I love. I encourage you to check out some of her work. She talks about the danger of a single story, right? The danger of these numbers. And the danger is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. The stories we are weaving in the performing arts are incomplete. And I think about what if orchestras had just been doing what Bernstein did for the past 50 years, if every American orchestra had done that, <coughs> let the main leading institutions representing blacks and Latinos and informed them of every single audition. What if they would have brought to bear every American orchestra letters to all of our conservatories about the importance of scholarships for those because they realize the importance of building inclusion amongst their ranks. Think about our music schools, our performing arts schools. What if all music education programs had effective recruiting of diverse students? What if music educators prepared students to teach a broader range of curriculum? Imagine the repertoire that would be known by all of those who went into the field. What if our field was as diverse as our nation? How would people talk around you? How would you feel? I often ask people about this when I go and I talk to some institutions and organizations and I say, oh, and they say, well, we'd like to be more diverse. I said, now let's just take a moment and imagine if you went to your conservatory, you went to your orchestra and you just walked down the hall and 90% of the people you encountered were African American. And if I'm talking to someone who's white and I say, would you feel uncomfortable? What would the conversations be like? Would they be different? And not better or worse, but would they be more diverse? Would they be more inclusive? Would there be something added to the fabric of our own ecosystem within the arts. And I think about what if there had been no Sphinx? So what if you do nothing differently after this speech than you did before it? As you go through the next several days, I encourage you to keep the words of Susan Scott in mind. Again, she's got some great TED Talks and things like that out there, but one of, her, my, one of her quotes that is one of my favorites 
is this, when she says our work, our relationships, and our lives succeed or fail one conversation at a time. And while no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of your life, any conversation can. So speak and listen as if this is the most important conversation you will ever have with this person, because it could be. And participate as if it matters, because it does. And I encourage you over the next several days to approach every conversation that you have in an elevator, waiting for a drink, on a bus, in an Uber, wherever it might be, because you don't know if this is the conversation that will have this impact. It could be a collaboration that changes the trajectory of our field, and it will be given birth here over the next several days. I know that for sure because I've seen the work that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about from many of Sphinx alums, alums of the conference, alums of the competition and other programs. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this leadership and about the entrepreneurship aspect. So I thought it's important again to look at some of the data so that we know what happens to those who go to our performing arts institutions. What happens to them out in the field? So one of the core things was I was interested in how are they employed? So we have a great data set, by the way, through SNAP, uh, which I encourage any of you to take a look at. Again, you can find a lot of the information online. So arts alums who have been self-employed at some point since graduation, 80%. That means 80% of the people, and some of you, of course, in the audience are currently in performing arts institutions, 80% of you will be an entrepreneur. You will be self-employed at some point after graduation. And in fact, when they did this study, and this was just over the past couple of years, currently of all arts alumni, half currently were self-employed. Now, many of us know this intuitively and anecdotally, but it's important to understand it in terms of the data because it's important to understand what type of preparation is required for that reality. This study happened to capture what arts alumni think are important skill sets to have. So, what is important to arts alumni? No big surprise, artistic technique. 75% of, of arts alumni feel that artistic technique is an important skill set to have. Teaching skills, also 75% think this is obviously something that is, quote, important to their current work. That was the question that was posed. Leadership skills, 90%. So more arts alums think this is a more valuable skill set than their artistic technique or the teaching skills that they receive. Creative thinking, 98%. Whenever you do a study, nothing is 98%, by the way. So if you get something that's 98%, it's pretty much like a something that screams out to you, important, important, important. Dramatically more important to all arts alums than their artistic technique and teaching skills. And obviously, I'm the last person to stand up here and say, these are not important, because obviously they are, and they will always be the benchmark of what we are doing in our educational institutions. But what it does indicate is that these other areas are important. And our institutions that don't realize that will be doing a disservice to those who are giving their hard-earned resources to be prepared by them, to be educated by them. And finally, entrepreneurial skills, 70%. So also, almost at the same level as artistic technique and teaching skills. So again, critically important, but here I wanted to add one other factor because I thought this was important, is that while 70% of arts alums believe that entrepreneurial skills are important, only 30% believe that they got any at the institution that they attended. Glaring shift that we need to bring about in our institutions, not just of higher learning, but I believe this affects everything. Educational programs that orchestras are doing, community organizations, the work that Sphinx is doing, obviously I shared with everybody at Sphinx as well. Critically important. So this helps to do, and again, this is SNAP, it's the Strategic National Arts Alumni Project. I encourage you to check it out. There's a lot more information there uh, that's available in that data set, so I encourage you to check it out. But what if we prepared all of our students for the lives they actually end up living? 
One additional component I wanted to share with you about this was this idea of creative careers. And this is not only for those of you who are preparing others or those of you who are looking to prepare for careers, but those who are in the midst of your creative careers. So I believe there are several key components that I wanted to share that kind of relate to this idea of innovation, which is key in our field, and I believe the arts thrive on innovation. So let's look at this. One of my favorite quotes, by the way, is Brene Brown, uh, who says, there is no innovation and creativity without failure, period. It is not just enough to say, I'd love to be innovative. Trust me, you are not being innovative if you are not having some increased level of a failure rate. Because by definition, you're doing something new. It's just not going to be perfect. So you have to get comfortable with failure. It is part of that process. It's talked about a lot in the tech sector. So innovation, a key point in terms of building a creative career. Writing, I could go on and on and spend an entire session, but I cannot tell you the number of times that I have been shocked by the lack of quality in writing of young entrepreneurs, of orchestra members, of college professors, of musicians, of artists. It's astounding. I don't understand it fully, um, the why, but what I do know is that it's critical because if you are going to be innovative and if you're going to leave a creative life, you must have the ability to articulate what it is that you want to do on paper. Otherwise, it will be next to impossible to garner the resources, the collaborators, the people that you need because, you need because no entrepreneur works alone. No entrepreneur is successful alone. They only do it through collaborators, through interesting engagement with other people, institutions, etc. So writing, absolutely critical. And entrepreneurship, of course, entrepreneurial skill sets, which we had talked about before. At Michigan, we do this through our Excel program, and we have coursework, workshops, support, uh, empowerment. We actually now are providing more direct support to students for entrepreneurial projects than any other performing arts uh, institution in the country, which I'm excited about, but I'm hoping will be a catalyst for other performing arts institutions to provide more direct support to their students as well, which will create this ongoing incubator of actual ideas and students empowered to realize them while they are at our institutions, in addition to learning the actual skill sets. And especially related to our time here, note that networking is under every single one of these areas because it is critically important. For everything that we do, you again have to be able to connect with others, both for resources and for the actual work that you do. So one of the things that's been amazing that oftentimes people don't often think about with Sphinx is that there are incredible Sphinx entrepreneurs. I'm just gonna share a couple but the list is far greater than this, and if you are in the room and I'm not including you, I apologize in advance because there is simply just too many of them. But just a few quick highlights. Kelly Hall Tompkins, Music Kitchen, like transforming, bringing amazing high-level musicians, members of the New York Philharmonic and others into homeless shelters. Kevin Sylvester, Black Violin, amazing stuff. We're about to have the launch of Exigence. Right, with Eugene Roberts, Danielle Belin launched Center Stage Stratton, which is now absolutely becoming one of the most prominent, important summer music institutions in the country. Robin Quinette in the Montserrat Music Festival. Cameron Williams in the Kamenized Strings Foundation. Stanford Thompson, Play on Philly, one of the leading El Sistema programs in the country. Francisco Villa, Esmeraldas Music Festival. So there's a huge international component of what's taking place. Melissa White and Elena Uriosti, intermission, engaging, of course, and bringing also yoga into and wellness into the idea of music making and art making. We are very, very diverse, so Shelby Harris and popcorn. We don't stop with just music and the arts. Janina Bearfield and the Public Quartet, Terrence Patterson, Ritz Chamber Players, Joseph Conyers and Project 440. Stephanie Matthews, who's now, of course, part of the Sphinx team as well. String Candy, Chichi and Wanako, and Chineke Orchestra, which has taken Europe by storm and is doing incredible things uh, across the pond. Carla Derlikov Canalis and the Canalis Project. Again, incredible work. Angelica Durrell with Intake Music, reaching out to young people as well and those from uh, immigrant populations. There is a landscape and an ecosystem that has been being developed 
through the entrepreneurial activities of Sphinx alums. And finally, I wanted to kind of talk about, and related to this creative career, a sense about living a portfolio life or a career life as I, or sorry, a portfolio career or a portfolio life, as I really like to refer to. I feel like I have a portfolio life. And in many ways, this is just like a financial portfolio. In other words, the more diversified you are, often, the better. So I wanted to kind of give you just kind of a snapshot of this, and this is something that we actually teach our students at Michigan, and how to not just unintentionally fall into a portfolio career, but how do you intentionally architect one for yourself? So historically, just to give you an idea, you know, back, you know, as I was just kind of developing Sphinx and so on and so forth, I developed Sphinx, I had written my uh, autobiography, I had board service, I, Deliberation is an independent film that I wrote and directed and produced, I founded Jumpstart, which is a homeless organization, I had written a children's book, The First Adventures of Chili Peppers, I launched The Bard, which is a literary magazine, read by 60,000 people in southeast Michigan. Uh, Common Ground, which was another television pilot. They said I wasn't really black, which was the first poetry book that I wrote. 20 to 6, which was an internet television show. Battle of the Bricks, which was a Lego building competition for underserved young people. It ended up with over a million Legos from Lego. They were wonderfully supportive. Uh, EarthPro, which was an environmental company. EthnoVibe, which is where I developed a lot of the diversity uh, initial projects, including the EthnoVibe Quartet, which I had founded at Michigan. Afa and Maya's first CD, uh, entitled Bartok, that we did on electric violins. Uh, my CD, Ebony Rhythm, which is when I began to get into spoken word, and The Catalyst. That was, uh, which is an entrepreneurship show, kind of like a shark tank for social entrepreneurs. So that's a historical portfolio. And I wanted to share with you kind of what my current portfolio life is today. And again, I share this as kind of just an idea of an example as you think about intentionally architecting. So one of the things about my approach to a portfolio life is that I always have a singular focus. So for example, historically, that was always Sphinx. There was a priority. And whenever I felt a conflict or faced with a conflict, there was absolutely no doubt in terms of my decision making that Sphinx was the priority. I made the transition to Michigan, and so now, of course, Michigan has been and is that priority for me, now in my teaching capacity as a faculty member. So, but in addition to that, I still am able to advise and to engage with Sphinx and to, uh, you know, try and fulfill expectations when they ask me to be able to be involved to help the work that the organization continues to do so phenomenally under AFA's leadership. Arts Force, which is basically a competitive format, but for those who have served our military and to be able to empower their artistic development and artistic careers through a competitive format. Aaron Ask, if any of you haven't seen, is my weekly video mentoring show, uh, which you can pull up online and, uh, and check out, which they come out every Monday. Ethos is actually next week, launches in paperback, but is my most recent book, uh, which is a science fiction uh, novel, all that takes place in Detroit and Flint and reflects social issues today through a futuristic setting. Aaron Dworkin Project is the artistic work that I do. I do presenting and speaking, and then I serve on boards like the National Endowment for the Arts, the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs, Sistema Global, the Dworkin Foundation, which we had founded to do our own philanthropy, uh, and Gamesition, which is actually a game design company uh, that I have developed and working on some new games, and I'm also involved in some cryptocurrency investments. So, yeah, which is, not for the faint of heart, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, might need to add more to my portfolio. To, no, um, actually, it's very fascinating uh, industry. Uh, and actually, if there are those who are, uh, who are actually finding it to be very interesting and productive and beneficial. Uh, so I love this Albert Einstein quote, which is, strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. And it's something that I talk with students always. Is, I'm sorry, oh, I want to do this. I want to be a CEO of something. Or, like, no, no, no. What do you want to do to bring value? And how can you develop your own skill sets so that you bring value? If you increase your value, then there will be no doubt that success will come and financial remuneration will come. The purpose is to bring value and to develop your own value. So what if our field was comprised of a culturally diverse mosaic of artists and leaders who were prepared to have intentional portfolio lives. 
So as I begin to get into some closing things and then uh, uh, keep in mind it'll be, I'm trying to leave as much time for questions as possible, I wanted to share two more uh, kind of major areas. So this first one relates to institutional change especially and managing it. And the reason why I wanted to mention it is because oftentimes people would share with me, oh, well, you know, Sphinx is trying to bring this about with diversity and inclusion. That's easy for Sphinx to do because it's its main focus. But we are X big orchestra. We are X big music school or conservatory. We have so many things on our plate. Yes, this could be kind of one thing, but again, we just can't, we can't focus on it. We cannot bring about the change that you otherwise expect or desire from us. And I want to share with you that I patently disagree with that approach. And I encourage you from this moment forward to not accept hearing it from anybody. And, <laughs> and the reason that I feel I can say that so emphatically now is because I've been in that role, running a major $60 million higher education, institution of learning with many, many other priorities. So I wanted to just share with you over a two year period, a reflection of some of this change because the reality is, is that I am absolutely not smarter than other leaders. I don't have some kind of other secret ability. But what I did was I said, these are the things that I think are important. And then I went to our constituency and to all of the various parts of what are often very complex institutions. I said, what do we think is important? And how important do we think it is? And what should we do about it? But then I did frame timelines. And I said, OK, and once we figure this out, we're going to do what we figured out. And it may or may not work. And in the end, when you're in the leadership position, you're like, hey, I take the fall for it. If it didn't, doesn't work but we're going to do something. And that is what I did not leave in question or the opportunity not to. And I said, and if we can't, and we put together various groups and working groups, and if those working groups can't figure it out, then unfortunately, I will have to try and figure it out. But if we know it's important and we all know we wanna do something about it, then sitting around and doing nothing is not an option. So just a couple of quick things. Over two years, the institution experienced over 30% increase in applications and 20% increase in the matriculation of diverse students, underrepresented students, largest in the history of the institution and the school. Doubled community engagement activities, created leadership roles for finance and inclusion, surpassed campaign goals of over $100 million, but that is in very large part to you know, all of the amazing work of my predecessors who did the bulk of work on that campaign. Developed live streaming and professional audio recording, didn't exist, added it to all of the venues, created a chamber music department which didn't exist, created Emprise, which now serves as the largest chamber music competition in the world, created entrepreneurship, there was no entrepreneurship department and career development department, created that and all the staffing surrounding it. Those are just a couple of examples, but the reason why I'm bringing them up is because if our field experienced this and everyone engaged in this type of disruptive evolution, what would happen to inclusion across our field? What would happen if all of a sudden every music school had a 20% increase in underrepresented people? And then in four years, we saw all of those people entering into the field. What would orchestras, they would be amazed. And what if orchestras did the same for theirs? So I wonder if every institution engaged in this type of disruptive evolution, and make no mistake about it, it is disruptive. And the more static an organization or institution has been, the more disruptive the change will be. But I'd rather have the disruption than the lack of change, because I feel the lack of change is simply no longer acceptable. The role that we play in the arts in our society is critically important. We are often that way in which we connect to people who differ from us, socially, culturally, socioeconomically, but the arts bind us. They are a critical role in a civil society. I think this is important, more important than ever. So what if we prepared our students with skill sets additive to their core areas of study? We can't decrease the level that we're building craft because you can't do anything without excellence. 
absolutely. But what if we were additive to that? And what if every arts leader and teacher took strategic risks associated with this level of change and impact? So my hope is that my story will encourage each and every one of you in your role to, if you will, throw the dice and see what happens. And Sphinx, I believe, has provided everyone literally with dice. So if you don't throw it, there's absolutely no excuse. So imagine a future if you were the one who could determine if these things could happen. Because you are, absolutely, every single person in this room is. So I wanted to share, and for those of you who may not know, Aristotle's three forms of persuasion, but I wanted to share it because I think it's an important asset to have as you begin to look at and think about change um, and things that you may want to do in the field because I've been utilizing this as I speak to you. So he has these three basic forms, if you will, of persuasion. First is ethos. People must know your character. Right? That's why I first shared with you who I am, my background. You need to know that. You need to understand that what I'm sharing is authentic and why on earth do I care about it? So your ethos, right? I happen to like that word, obviously, given the book. Logos, then you also have to share some type of facts, right? Logic, that's why I shared the data with you about the field, so that there's no doubt this isn't some kind of dream, this isn't some kind of, well, this would be nice, or, or let's try and overblow this, prob this problem. No, we need to actually have some type of logic. We need to know what is going on. And then finally, pathos, you need to bring the emotion into it. You need to be able to empower people to visualize, to feel what that change is going to be. And that's why I share with the question of what if we can visualize, if we can imagine what things could be like. Lyndon Johnson on signing into existence the NEA, he said, art is a nation's most precious heritage for it is in our works of art that we reveal to ourselves and to others the inner vision which guides us as a nation and where there is no vision the people perish. And so this idea of the public standing of the arts is important. And so as I get ready to close, I wanted to just share this information, again, some data, but about public support of the arts. Now initially, these are gonna seem a little dramatic, but I also wanna explain them and put them in a little bit of context, right? So Germany, as a country, spends about $11 billion on arts and culture. The city of Berlin, 680 million. And of course, in the US, through the NEA, our appropriation is about 146 million. So obviously it's kind of dramatic, but what we should really look at is how do nations spend as it relates to arts and culture as a percentage of GDP. Now Germany is high. They tend to do more, they're about 2%. Most Western nations are about 1%. France is 1%, Britain's almost 1%. Unfortunately, we are not 1%, we're not a tenth of a percent. We are not a hundredth right, of a percent, or 0 0.005%. So now, that's important to understand in terms of certain public funding for the arts, but it's also important to understand that there is foundation funding. We do have a thriving foundation community, and that is important and plays a key role in the arts and for many of the organizations that we're uh, affiliated with in one way or another. So the total foundation giving is about 22 billion, and of that, 2.3 billion are arts and culture grants. Of those, 200 million benefit underserved communities. But if you are a focused arts funder, it's only 100 million. And this information, by the way, is from the NCRP. You can check a look at it, National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy. Um, but the, important of no, the importance of noting with focused arts funders, so a focused arts funder is defined as a funder where more than 25% of their grant making goes to arts organizations. What this data tells us is that arts funders give less as a percentage of their funding to benefit underserved communities than other foundations. Now there's a host of reasons that go into all of this, but it is yet another data point to take into account. Another one that I wanted to add to you is just simply size and power of organizations. If we look at all arts organizations in the country, those that have a budget greater than five million dollars represent less than two percent of all arts organizations. Yet those organizations receive 55% of all of the funding. If we take it a little bit further, and we just look at the top 50 organizations alone, just the top 
five zero arts organizations in the country. They represent 0 .000, you can't even see the line, 0.0005% of all arts organizations. Those 50 receive half of all foundation funding. So if you're not one of them, you are out of half of that funding. And what Holly Sidford, who wrote in this said, was that this pronounced imbalance restricts the expressive life of millions of people, thus constraining our creativity as a nation. The asymmetry disadvantages all of us. And it makes me think back to Chimamanda Adichie's words about the danger of a single story. It's not that they're untrue. It's not that this work that's being done by these smaller, uh, small subset of organizations with huge amounts of resources isn't good work. In some ways, it's amazing work, but it's incomplete. And that's the important thing to keep in mind and to think about as we think about how we influence the institutions that we come in touch with. So I think about what if our public funding looked like other nations? What would it look like? What if 2% of our GDP was going to arts and culture and 90% of the funding was going to those organizations that were the smallest and the most community-based? What would the country look like? What would our national dialogue be like? So I wanted to try and find a quick example of kind of what this might look like. So again, I said the National Endowment for the Arts, the annual appropriation is about $146 million, and it is often, obviously, under attack, um, or those who want to diminish it or even wipe out the agency. Uh, we won't get into that conversation. So I wanted to see, is there an example I could give of just a comparison of public funds that might even relate to the arts? Well, and there actually is, because in the military, we have music. So we actually have a budget for the military bands. Doesn't include even personnel, so it's just the budget for military bands. It is more than double the entire NEA. And the reason is because there isn't doubt about the relevance. There isn't doubt about the value to the institution. The role of music going back through the history of the military is deep and it's powerful. Our commander in chief doesn't enter a room without music. Right? Often I had the opportunity to dance uh, at the White House to the president's own band. It's everywhere as it relates to the military. And there's a reason for that, because that relevance isn't in doubt. So that responsibility is on us if we want to be able to have the arts speak to the experiences that we all have. I wanted to just share a quick clip. Some of you may have seen it, but I had developed, I do a lot of you know, spoken word with music, and so uh, Lara and, and Yo-Yo were uh, generous enough to join me for this piece that I wanted to do with a comment on the role of the arts in society, um, which we did this year, um, and it was just called The Arts Wall, speaking to the idea of the role that ideally the arts could play, as opposed to those things that divide us. Uh, so this is just a quick clip from that. So like Maya, still I rise and speak out to state the character of my state lies not in doubt when the art of children still fills our tenement hall. Some of those of you listening to uh, the Sphinx rep will note that piece. So what if you choose to experience this speech, this Sphinx connect differently? What if you choose to take just one thing I've shared and empower it to change a part of your work, a part of your life? What if you evolve our field in a way that is truly transformative? What if you take what are just words that I'm sharing, but make them tangible? What if you change just one more life than you would have before this gathering of incredible artistic spirits? You think about that impact incrementally changing one person, one life, 
that Afra referenced. Patrice Jackson, who you see on the bottom right, performed uh, in Atlanta for a conference on black philanthropy, and Coretta Scott King was there. And I had a chance to talk with her after Patrice played. There were tears in her eyes, and she was talking to me about the role that music played in her and Martin Luther King's life. You know, they met at a conservatory, one of our institutions, NEC, right? And they grew up with music, and music played a huge role in the fight and the life struggle that they did. And the words that she shared with me really reminded me of this amazing quote of her husband's, which is, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And I submit to all of you this work that all of you are so invested in, this craft that so many of you have developed that enables us to speak with one another, to share with one another, to empathize with those who are different from us. This work matters more than ever. And I hope that over the next few days, you'll think about what if you're able to throw the dice as you think about diversity, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. So thank you all for inviting me to be able to be here with you. I'm looking forward to the next few days, and I think we'll be able to take some questions. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I think we will even have some questions on, on slide, Slido. Slido. <laughs> so this is from an anonymous asker. How have you seen disruption most effectively led from within an institution versus led from an executive position? Ah, great question. Uh, so, and for those who didn't hear, where, uh, how have I seen effective disruption led from within an institution as opposed to from its leader. Uh, and I can actually give you an example uh, from Michigan. Uh, so Michigan is home to center stage strings. Uh, and uh, that is not remotely my uh, creation or birth. Or it is the work and the creativity and the commitment and the collaborations developed by Sphinx alum Danielle Belin. Um, and so now an institution is able to benefit by having one of the premier summer programs there because one of its faculty members developed such a, a, a program. Um, similarly goes with a lot of the entrepreneurship work. So I've seen it a fair amount uh, at Michigan. Um, I don't necessarily, at least right off the top of my head, am I thinking about key things, although, for example, I would think about the originations of the Music Assistance Fund at the New York Philharmonic. So I think there are, and there, are, and actually I would share this, that I am absolutely confident that there are numerous examples that I'm not able to share because I might not be personally aware of them. But what I absolutely know is that any person at any level in any institution can. You may not always be successful, you may fail because you're being innovative, but if you haven't even tried, and I would say most institutions are ones that if you bring a good idea and you bring it to the leadership, as long as you, know, you can figure out, for example, how to at least financially test it so it doesn't destroy the organization, um, that uh, there are more leaders than you might think who will be interested and want to invest in those ideas. So, but great question. Yes? Hi, my name is uh, Amanda Kemp and I'm a theater artist and I'm got up to ask this question before I lost my nerve. <laughs> Great. And that is, this costs no money. <laughs> and it's to you, Aaron. Um, in the light of, of our current leadership and this whole I idea of making America great again, I want to invite you um, and anyone else in this room, no money involved, to be part of a flash mob tomorrow night 
at 10.30 p.m. And it's gonna be to a spoken word and music piece called Make America Great, Not the Land of Hate, again. Wow, So awesome. if you were into that idea, please right. meet us downstairs in the food court at 10.30 p.m. tomorrow night. And you can talk to Samuel Thompson for more details. That's awesome, well thank you. And, and a perfect example, a prime example, of the type of innovation and ideas and initiative that I think is going to just explode from this amazing group of people. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll go uh, over here and then we'll come back over. Uh, good evening. My name is Charles Babatu Murphy. Um, I'm a career and technical education teacher in St. Louis Public Schools, and I thank mm -hmm. Ancestors and Sphinx for my granddaughter, who's a cellist from Chicago, it's right there. She invited me, and I said, sure, why not go be a fellow? Well, I just want to tell everyone I am really glad I came. I am a specialist in disruptive evolution. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I stay in trouble in my district. But what I have found, and, and by the way, <laughs> just a teacher at <laughs> public school. Um, when I came in, and they'll let you know, I started bothering all the people in the tech booth. And I even went over and bothered the young lady who was on camera. Y'all need to give her a hand because we don't see a lot of women doing tech support. Where y'all hands at? Yes. <laughs> But the reason I'm bringing that up, in, in career and technical education, I teach radio and TV, so I teach media. And what I'm finding is, you know, I'm going out and I'm finding all these different uh, devices and technology, but if you noticed, the microphones they were using weren't right up on those uh, instruments. So that takes a whole set of technical skills to be able to make sure the audience feels the performance. And there are tons of jobs and careers in those areas. And if you can look at those areas, there's underrepresented under people in those areas. So awesome. that's just my Great. first. I'm cons thank committed so it to actually, that. So actually, because I want to make sure we get other questions okay. in. But thank you. But thank you very you much. Real quick so, OK, really quick, really but quick. then I want to make sure we get okay. to other questions. Yes. Yeah. I was in uh, Cairo some years back, mm -hmm. and I saw the Sphinx. <laughs> and I just knew Sphinx Connect had some kind of connection to the Sphinx. <laughs> I even wrote a poem which I want to share with you, so I want to make sure I can do that. Please tell me there's a connection with the Sphinx. So, yes, in terms of whether Sphinx would like to actually play there? Not just that, that but the Sphinx itself. Oh, where yes. Napoleon yes. shot the yes, nose right. off so, and yeah. all that good stuff. So, yes, absolutely. Actually, on our website, there is even a part that talks about the origin of, uh, origination of the name. Um, the history in terms of the continent, um, and also in terms of what it meant to various societies and civilizations that live there in terms of a standard of excellence. And one that, for example, is one that Sphinx upholds for all of its participants in the competition itself. Because putting all of diversity, uh, inclusion, all of those things aside, what is absolutely critically important is this standard of excellence that is required of all participants with Sphinx. So thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Rachel. Hi, so this is an experience that I've been having and I'm still having and I wanna bring it up because others may be also currently having this problem and may have it in the future. What you do when you have an idea that you really believe in and you go to a whole bunch of different funders and everybody says that this is such a great idea and it really needs to be done but because it's so different and has never been done before, it literally doesn't fit their guidelines, so you can't get any funds. Great question. You got me with such a tough question, but it's actually a really important question because this does happen, and the reality is, is that's what happened at the beginning of Sphinx. There were no funders that I could go to that were funding you know, inclusion in the performing arts. I couldn't find it in any you know, listings. Um, and so, uh, so one, I would say that you need to be able to try to find a way that what it is you do fits 
with their funding, so with their funding patterns, so that you can at least begin to engage a conversation. So that's what I would do is study very, very hard foundations, priorities, just their general areas that were there. So for example, if they just listed education, I was like, okay, what we are doing absolutely has an education aspect to it. Or if they just fund arts and culture, I'm like, well, obviously arts and culture is part of what we do. So then finding out, looking at the grants that they've made, those types of things and say, okay, is there some way in which I can make the argument to start to say, at least we should have a conversation. Um, so looking and saying, okay, well, if you do this, here is a way that we fit into that. Um, and it's not always easy, but so I would say absolutely studying and seeing if you can have that. Number two is kind of very pragmatic and logistical. And it is, is there someone that you know who knows the program officer? And there is a great network here over the next several days that you can connect with because the reality is that sometimes you just need to know somebody who knows someone to get access just to have a conversation. I wish that the world didn't work like that, but the reality is not all of it does, but some of it does, and sometimes the majority of it does. Um, and there are absolutely, in the first several years of Sphinx, absent of several of my key mentors who literally picked up the phone to foundations and funders who they knew and said, you need to actually return this Aaron Dworkin's call. I know you don't want to, I know you are not, but here's why you should. And identifying and finding people who may have that access who will do that, who will not just be mentors, but be sponsors for you, in that the difference, I think, for mentorship is they're able to provide you with direct feedback, but the sponsor is someone who will actually act on your behalf and influence your trajectory directly, and that's one of the things that it was able to have. And then third, I would just add that um, there have been times where that has just happened, and regardless of any of our attempts, we just can't find something can't find a way to fund something. And at that point, then I look and I say, is there any way we can just do it anyway? <laughs> and can we find artists who will believe in it, who will hold off on being paid? W can we find people who will just work on it in a volunteer facet? Um, are there places, venues that won't charge us because they'll let us hold it there? Um, and that is the reality of what is you know, called in-kind support. Um, but that has been fundamental. It was born out of necessity in inaugural Sphinx, where the University of Michigan provided space, right? I couldn't afford as a student those types of things. The University of Michigan actually did give us a small grant too um, the first year. Um, and But continues to this day, on average at least going back, and I don't know exactly those details um, these days, but going back, you know, say a decade, you know, easily almost a third of Sphinx's budget was in-kind support. Um, and not only does it enable you to do more than you otherwise would be able to do, but it also builds investment of, um, of those who believe in the institution because they are donating their time or their resources in such a way. So those are at least three options that hopefully can be a little bit helpful. So thanks so much. Yes. This is a popular question on Slido. Aha. How crucial to the success of students of color is being taught by a teacher of color? How can white teachers empower students of color? Great question. So the importance of having a teacher um, of color. I would share this because it's really a, it's a great question. I am not so sure how on an individual basis the color, cultural background of one of your teachers is. Most of my teachers obviously were white. I didn't really have a choice in that. Um, but if none of your teachers reflect your cultural background, then I think that has a huge impact. So I don't think necessarily one particular teacher, but if you lack the ability to be in an environment, especially an educational environment, that lacks any representation of your culture or your gender, then I think that that would make the learning process, the educational process, much, much, much more difficult. It was not until I got to the University of Michigan, so studying as a, as a college student, that I knew there were any black classical composers. Never heard of William Grant Still, Roe Kicker Dad, no idea. If someone would have said, I had no idea. My teacher actually told me, my Caucasian teacher said, are you interested in playing these works? 
and I didn't think he was really serious. And then he starts pulling all of these volumes of works off his shelves because he actually happened to be one of the very, very, very few at that point in time in the country who knew all of these works and in many cases knew the composers like David Baker. And so he opened up my mind to that. And so even though he didn't culturally reflect, he reflected more than you know, many of the other teachers that I had. So I'm not necessarily sure on an individual basis, but in a community, if there is the lack, then I think that has a profound effect. And it has a profound effect if none of your peers reflect who you are as well. Great questions. Yeah. Hello. Okay. My name's uh, Ulysses, and I wanted to ask you, and it's a uh, statement too, in a way. Uh, Aaron Dworkin for President 2020. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you, have you ever contemplated running? <laughs> you literally the, hit like everything that's being needed. I'm I'm uh, deeply honored by your uh, your comment, but but I can unequivocally, unlike a lot of political answers you often hear, I can unequivocally and emphatically say absolutely not. <laughs> that's never going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, no, I don't. I think that the way in which and and there may definitely be. Um, people in, you know, who are part of the La Familia of Sphinx uh, who are here who may definitely be thinking about running. And certainly one of the things at least that we hear and we know already from those who are registering um, is that there certainly is going to be a significant gender change in candidates coming up. Uh, and I think that that will be, uh, you know, a phenomenal profound impact. But, uh, but no, I, uh, it's not my, I think that my, um, ability, and I think this is interesting actually to think about and to, to talk about, but about how, what role will you have to affect change? And I think that's really important because a lot of times people think, oh, I need to, you know, be president, I need to be a senator, or I need to be the president of a, of a, of a college or a, a university, or I need to be the president of an orchestra, and you don't necessarily to bring about change. Um, one of the things that really impacted me, I was sitting and the University of Michigan went through its bicentennial. I was sitting and I was watching this um, great uh, event that we did surrounding it. And through it were a lot of the stories from alums who have gone on to do you know, incredible, amazing things. And all of their stories and their attributions were to faculty members. No one was congratulating a dean. No one was thanking the presidents of the university. They were thanking their faculty. And when you think about all of it in the performing arts, right, we think about the roles of our private teachers and what they played in our lives, not the presidents necessarily of the institutions. So don't necessarily think that you need to be in a leadership position to bring about profound change. So, but great question. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm deeply honored. Thank you. This yeah. question is from Lim Lim Kobe. When you begin to plan for a project, what questions do you ask yourself in order to fill in the big picture? And sorry, the, can you just re repeat the first sure. one? Sure. Yeah. When you begin to plan a, for a project, mm -hmm. what questions do you ask yourself in order to fill in the big picture? Ah, great. So interestingly, I, um, or, so I just say with the big picture, I tend to, when I have an idea, begin with kind of a big picture vision but then I immediately vet the idea. And I actually have a whole class that I teach about on this for three hours about idea vetting. So there's a host of books you can get on it, so on and so forth, but it is critically important. And in that, one of the things that I did, this is you know in the early days, even before Sphinx, and I continue to this day, is that I have a small group of people whose values I deeply, whose opinions I deeply value. Um, but who I know will absolutely tell me the truth and tell me when they think an idea is ridiculous and wrong. Um, and it's not that I always follow their advice, but before I move forward with an idea, I always know what their advice and their feedback is because it definitely helps to give me the big picture of what types of challenges that I might find in pursuing that particular idea. Um, so vetting out your idea and of course vetting it out both in terms of the idea itself and whether it's relevant and will it have impact, but also financially. You absolutely have to. You know, you can talk all about all the work that we want to do. If you do not have the resources, then you can't do the work. The resources are not always cold money. 
It can sometimes be partnerships and in-kind and so on and so forth. But if you don't have the resources, then you simply cannot bring about the impact. So I think that that's really uh, critically important. Uh, but I tend to kind of go with that and to absolutely surround myself and get that feedback. And when I founded Sphinx, that I did exactly the same thing. I wasn't thinking about it as intentionally at the time, but I absolutely did do it. Thankfully and luck luckily, my teacher said, yes, this sounds like a great idea. Luckily, the dean, when we went and talked to him, said, yes, this sounds like a good idea. My parents didn't think it was a good idea. They were like, Why, what is this Mishigas? Can't you just practice and be a violinist? What's wrong with you? you know? um, so there will be people who don't. And it took a couple years, but then, of course, my parents did um, see the, the value. So thank you. Great question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I loved your idea of having a life portfolio to um, add to over your life of many different things that you're doing. Um, and I was noticing something that was on there that I dare say a woman might have put on immediately, which is the portfolio of your family, your children, your wife, your, your partner. And I was wondering, what do you do to, and I think it's important to, for a person to ask a man this more often, what do you do to support your family and how do you build that into your portfolio make room for it on it, and, and how can we do a better job of balancing the act between family and, and these wonderful things we're doing? That's one question. And my second question, sorry, is um, how do you get over the fear of, and I, because I think a lot of us are afraid of taking that first step on our projects to put into our po portfolio. How do you get over the fear of this idea it may fail and make that first step. What processes do you go through in your brain to get to that? <laughs> These are great questions, Diane. Um, so, uh, so first, uh, getting over the fear. Um, I am usually more afraid of the inaction than of doing the action. So, for example, when I started Sphinx, you know, I was going to orchestra concerts and not seeing anyone on stage or in the audience who looks like me. I was sitting in, and, and reveling and doing for my undergrad and grad recitals this amazing music by composers of color that I never even knew existed. And I could not believe that that was possible, that I could have. So I was deeply bothered. I hated that that was the reality, um, that as a biracial violinist, I could not even know about these things. Um, and it really, really bothered me. And so I tend to feel like you can't just sit and complain. Uh, and so for me, the fear of falling asleep every night and just going, I didn't do anything about it. I fear that more than trying and failing because at least then I fall asleep and I'm like, hey, I tried. Didn't pan out, I'll try something else. But you know, people go through a lot more you know, uh, challenges and, and hardships in life than trying an entrepreneurial idea and having it failure. It's kind of as my son likes to say, it's a first world problem, dad, you know, like, <laughs> come on, like, you know, put things in context, like get over yourself, it's not really that bad. Um, so, uh, so I really do think that, that in some ways they are. And when you put in context the issue you want to have an impact on, oftentimes it far outweighs the fear of, of failure. Um, if it's that important, it definitely does. And to your other question, which I think in some ways is even the more important question, um, I don't uh, strike a, a balance between my work life and family Family is the priority, period. And whenever I'm faced with a conflict, family wins out, period. Um, and, uh, and without getting into, you know, kind of uh, all of the, the things, but uh, so standard, uh, when, when you look at those issues, I think it's critically important that you look at um, what those needs are of your family and take them into account. And if they're in conflict with your professional life, look at it and say, how can you make changes? But to not just let it sit and fester on. Um, so most deans typically serve five-year terms, right? I shared with you guys a two-year track record. Uh, so because I was dean for two years, and then I stepped down. Um, and the reason I stepped down was, was family reasons. And so we were confronted with some things and looking at my time Time is probably our most valuable asset. 
and looking at my time at home, and especially as it relates to our boys. And there are roles that we have, and sometimes whether it's a performer and on the road, unless you can bring your family with you, or certain leadership roles like deanships, where especially deans of performing arts institutions, where you have many, many things going on, uh, hundreds and hundreds of events. And so if they take you away the majority of your weekdays and half of your weekends, um, then you have a different time profile at home. And so we actually had significant discussions about that and we realized that they were incompatible uh, given some challenges that we were just um, looking at. And so in that, there was absolutely no doubt. So the question and the conversations and the thought and if you will, the strategy was around how to make this a smooth transition and how to ensure that the institution, which I deeply love and care about, um, continues this important work, which it is under the phenomenal leadership that it currently has. So that's been fantastic, but it's, it is not easy. And here's the amazing thing. You talk about fears. I was fearful about coming and being like, so here's this decision, you know, I need to uh, step down. Um, and I wasn't sure how everyone would react. And what's amazing is the number of people that came up to me and shared their own stories of trying to fight this balance and some making what they felt later was the wrong decision and just sharing their stories with me. People I'd worked with or knew for years never knew these things about their stories, but when they saw that and heard about mine, it, it gave them a comfortability because oftentimes it's something you don't talk about because maybe a board won't want you if you're too into family or if whatever family situation you have requires too much, right? Um, I just don't, uh, I don't buy into that. And I should say it's not just for me personally, but Sphinx is led in such a way that every person at Sphinx on the Sphinx team, their it is understood, their family comes first. So Sphinx figures out what to do when someone has family needs to address. The person doesn't need to figure out how they address um, you know, Sphinx's needs. It's just from my perspective and coming and being adopted and you know, in a way having two families not have, or rather have conditional love, as in both of my families, at some point my adoptive family, uh, I, I was not in touch with for the majority of my adult life, and obviously my birth family who gave me up. Uh, for me, unconditional love is not an, it's, it's the only option, it's unwavering. So I don't have a work-life balance issue with, I have one clear priority. So, great question. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Jafari. I go by Kidu. I'm from New York. And sorry, just to let everyone know, I think we'll just have this and then that'll be the last question because I'm just getting times up things, so great. Uh, I really appreciate being here. This is my first time here. Um, and I have two questions for you. Great. Um, the first one is, um, how do you build a, a powerful portfolio to stand out to like hectomillionaire companies and um, when it comes to like being a composer or being an entrepreneur, especially yep. when you're African American. Yep. And the second question is, as an African American, what books do you recommend for composers and entrepreneurs? Gotcha, great. Uh, so, um, the, so the first, I would actually go right back to the comment that I made about instead of being of success, but building of value. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily look and say, oh, okay, I need this whole kind of portfolio um, that you know, looks good on paper, and especially credentials, um, they will sometimes get you in the door of certain things, but I would look to see how can you build value um, in what it is that you do. And so I would say with that related to composing, um, that that is actual uh, compositions or collaborations that you've done. And how can you do that in such a way so that it can bring value? Um, so when I think about Joel uh, Thompson in The Seven Last Words and how he built this value in an incredibly important piece. Uh, yes, absolutely, you know. And, and, and how um, that has increased his value. So more than saying I've got this and that and so on and so forth and I'm affiliated with this institution, here's a piece. Check it out. That's my value to you. I think in some ways can really speak very, very strongly. Um, and along with that, I, I can never minimize, and it's, it's bad because it's, we don't see it of value, but it is, and that is networks. Being able to access people who are gonna make key decisions 
That is important, and you have to be able to get the right person to see that work, to see that value, because they're often inundated by tons of things. So you have to be able to somehow work your way through that. Um, so you, if you will, need all the basics, but I think focusing on building your value would be key. Um, and in terms of specific books, wow, I would actually, I, I, I don't have specific recommendations in terms of specifically composition, but I would say this. Um, other than, of course, that you know, ethos will have so much benefit. No, <laughs> um, but what I would say actually is that what, the way I've benefited is that I didn't necessarily read um, many books about, um, uh, about things that were very specific to what it was that I was doing, but rather I tried to broaden um, my awareness and knowledge of how did other people do things. So for example, I read about things in sports and say, how did people address diversity in sports? How did people address things in these other fields other than the arts? Um, and I did that for two reasons. One, I think it's just important to be intellectually curious and to be able to then take those things. Um, but also, I think it's important because uh, sometimes if you're trying to be innovative, you can learn more from the people outside of your field than you can from the people within because otherwise the people within would have been doing the work that you're doing. Um, and so it's not to say to ignore it, but sometimes I can find that if you, if you read too much within a particular field, then you're gonna end up in a course like a bobsled run that's very hard to get out of. Um, but when you fill your intellectual curiosity with information from sometimes outside of your known field, it lets you look at things from a different place. And this is actually something that they do a lot, especially in tech and with maker spaces now, where they're bringing artists into maker spaces. They'd be doing something completely technological, but they're like, we just need an artist in the room. We need someone to fuel a thought pattern that is different from all of our engineers sitting right here. Um, so hopefully that could be a little bit of, of help. Thanks Thank so you. much. Yes. question. So um, when we're kids, we're often taught in school to like follow our dreams, everything. But in the reality of that is, and especially like in underprivileged minority communities, following your dreams is kind of not really accessible. Um, and I know I'm a, music I'm a music education major at Ohio State. So I decided to go major in that. That was kind of a Conflict. And I know in communities of color, like they, it's, con it's often concerned financial security is highly valued. So my question is for um, young people of color who have a strong passion for the arts, but who can't convince uh, their families that it is actually a lucrative thing. How can we do? How, how can we do that? How can we like convince them that this is a lucrative occupation to for those students to pursue their dreams? Yeah, good question. Thank you very much. Um, so first, I guess I have to share that, that I, I do patently disagree that you can't pursue your dreams. I've, I don't care what your circumstances are, I think you can pursue your dreams. Um, but I think then I wanna add to that what relates to a number of the things that you shared. And by the way, when, when I talk in any host of different environments, I always talk about that, that you can absolutely pursue whatever it is that you dream of, but you should know the data of it so that you know the challenge that lays ahead of you so you know the work or the steps you have to take. So I don't think it's of any help to have just kind of an arbitrary dream. I want to be, you know, the world's greatest soloist, I want, which is what I was saying when I was a kid. That's what I wanted to do. Um, or I want to, you know, be a, you know, a star athlete or, or something like that. That to me is like, okay, great, if that's the dream, but now let's actually look at what that specifically means and break it down. Um, and this is done by, and there's actually a process where you have outcome goals versus process goals. So you look and you say, the outcome is the dream. That's what I want. I want to be a member of the, you know, Detroit Symphony or the New York Philharmonic someday. Okay, that's great. And for mom and dad, that's, you know, a six-figure salary. Great, okay. So 
What does that mean? Well, that means I have to be unbelievably competitive. So I'd start that and say, okay, well, the average statistic is half of a percent, which is what it is to join a major American orchestra. It is five times more difficult than getting into an Ivy League school. So you look and you say, okay, actually, sorry, 20 times more difficult, five times more difficult than getting into Curtis, um, which is the most competitive school, about 4%, 3 or 4%, right? So, um, so you back it up from that and you say, okay, so to do that, obviously I have to have the level of training. And so what does that mean? And what is the amount of practice time that's required and so on and so forth? So whenever I'm talking with, with people who have a dream, wh whether they're a young person or someone, because I think you have a dream when you're 60 or 70, um, or older, uh, to look at it and then say, okay, that's great, but now let's realize the dream. And how can we go about that? And what I find is that when people then actually get into the process of realizing a dream, then they often find themselves going a different path because they're like, well, actually, no, I don't want to practice 10 hours a day. I actually don't want to do that. And now I realize that's what's required to be able to play excerpts like that. So that is no longer my dream, but they've chosen <laughs> to go on a different path or a different dream. Um, and it's not just the work aspect, but also the actual life. So some people are like, oh, I want to be a soloist. I'm like, okay, great. Let's look at some of the most phenomenal soloists. They're on the road 200 days a year. Do you want a family? Okay. So you'll be away from your family more than 200 days a year. Is that okay? And is that the type of life you want to build? Ah. So, what I, if you will, it's that whole idea of idea vetting, and maybe in a way it's almost dream vetting. Um, but I think no matter what your dream is, you should pursue it. You should go for it, no matter how unrealistic. Um, but then you just have to figure out how to make it happen and then go about the hard work to realize it. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, you guys, I love quotes, but Sherlock Holmes would always say to Dr. Watson, you have to take all of the facts into account. Whatever you're left with, no matter how improbable, is the truth or the path to follow. Um, and so I think any dream is possible. Uh, I was an undergraduate student who had previously been a college dropout and had been poverty stricken and almost homeless. And Sphinx, you know, led by Afa is doing this incredible work. Any, any dream is, is possible, absolutely. And and, and I would argue that, that Alpha or I or, or any of the Sphinx team um, are um, just like everybody else uh, in this room. We all have the capacity within us to do amazing things to change the world. And it's just whether we make the right decisions to do so. And hopefully all of you over the next few days will be able to connect with one another and make those types of decisions that will be able to have a transformative effect on our field and through our field, overall society. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.